the weather can't make up its mind, we can help you make up yours. Check on the BBC Weather app. Live from London, this is BBC News. Vladimir Putin is sworn in as Russia's president for a fifth time, extending his quarter of a century rule over Russia by a further six years. Israel takes control of the Gazan side of the Rafah crossing as unofficial ceasefire talks are set to resume in Cairo. Personal information of serving UK military personnel has been compromised in a hack. China is suspected to be behind the attack. Laurel extravagance on the red carpet as stars attend the Met Gala in New York. Hello and welcome, I'm Samantha Simmons. President Vladimir Putin has been sworn in for a new six-year term at a ceremony at the Kremlin. Putin, who's been in power as president or prime minister since 1999, now begins his new mandate more than two years after he sent tens of thousands of troops into Ukraine. In March, Vladimir Putin won a landslide victory in a tightly controlled election from which two anti-war candidates were barred on technical grounds. Britain, Canada and most European Union nations decided to boycott the swearing-in, but France said it would send its ambassador. In his address, Putin was unapologetic about invading Ukraine and pledged to continue to uphold Russia's interests. We will overcome this very difficult period, this turning point period, and we will pursue our long-term plans and priorities. But first of all, we have to save the people of the country. We have to preserve our values and traditions and particularly protect uh, voluntary, non-state and religious organizations and civil society. The measures we take must be uh, targeted and must be realizable. We will be open to cooperation with all countries who see in Russia a um, honest partner. We will not refuse or reject any kind of dialogue with the Western world. We are determined to, to parry aggression and to particularly counter those who uh, are, are aggressive towards our country. Let's get more now with our Russia editor at BBC Monitoring, Vitaly Shevchenko, who joins me from the newsroom. Vitaly, good to see you. What stood out for you in President Putin's address? Well, what happened and what was said at the Kremlin uh, this morning um, may not be what it really seems. Um, the way Vladimir Putin came to power, a lot of people would would hesitate to call it an election after all of his key opponents were barred from running. His key political rival, Alexei Navalny, um, is, is dead. Uh, freedom of press is, is gone in Russia. And now, when, when Vladimir Putin um, read his oath, uh, presidential oath, during the ceremony, his right hand was on the Russian constitution, and he pledged to defend the constitution and the rights and freedoms of Russian citizens, but if you open that right red book um, on, who, on which Vladimir Putin's hand rested, it lists various freedoms and, and rights that don't really exist in Russia anymore, such as freedom of thought, freedom of expression, uh, uh, media freedoms, um, the constitution, the Russian constitution bans censorship, and under Vladimir Putin's rule, what the constitution says is often has very little to do with uh, real life in, in Russia. 
And what sense did you get from his wording about what now for his war on Ukraine or his special military operation, as he calls it? He is as defiant as ever. Uh, he is firmly in control of pretty much anything that happens in Russia. The message to both the public in Russia and, and uh, people um, outside of Russia is that I still want to finish what I started in Ukraine. I want to uh, finish my uh, special military operation. And he claimed that he has the support of the Russian people. That, but the fact is, whoever challenges the, the, uh, the party line, the official thinking coming out of the Kremlin these days, um, risks being fined at the very least and possibly sent to jail. Uh, and, and as Alexei Navalny found out, uh, death is a possibility as well. So from that point of view, any challenge um, against uh, Vladimir Putin's thoughts on Ukraine and anything else that matters to him is all but ruled out. Okay, Vitaly, for now, thank you. To the Middle East now, and the Israeli military says its forces have taken control of the Palestinian side of the Rafah crossing, which borders Egypt and southern Gaza. These are the latest pictures that show the view at the crossing from on board an Israeli military vehicle. Aid organisations operating there say the flow of aid into the territory through the crossing has stopped. Israel continued to bombard Rafah overnight after rejecting a ceasefire proposal which was put forward by international mediators and agreed by Hamas. Israel says the plan doesn't meet its core demands. Israel is, though, sending a delegation to indirect talks in Cairo. Our Middle East correspondent Yulan Nell has more. The Israeli army has put out footage that shows these Israeli tanks rolling into this key crossing, the Rafah crossing between uh, Gaza and Egypt. It says it's taken operational control there um, and it's dealing, it says, with Hamas uh, terrorist infrastructure, to use its language, in that area. It says it's killed 20 Hamas terrorists um, overnight and that it has also found three uh, tunnel shafts um, and it's linking operations around uh, this part of Rafah to the rocket fire that it says uh, came from this area fried by Hamas um, on Sunday, which killed four Israeli soldiers close to the Karem Shalom crossing, leading to the closure of that important crossing in the south of the Gaza Strip as well. Um, now, at the moment, when we're taking briefings from the Israeli military, they're stressing that this is a very precise, it's a limited uh, operation. They're not putting a time frame on it. Um, they said, too, that they are working to reopen the Karem Shalom crossing um, as security allows. And tell us more about this potential ceasefire deal which Hamas said it supports. Israel says it goes a long way from meeting uh, its demands. We understand that unofficial talks are still going to take place today in Cairo. What more do we know about that? Well, at the moment, this ceasefire deal is really hanging in the balance because of the different positions we had, you know, that declaration from Hamas that was quite dramatic, saying it agreed to what the mediators have proposed, uh, Israel coming out quickly um, and uh, denying that this was the proposal that it had signed up to, saying that there were um, differences from its core demands. But we also have had, confusingly, some officials coming out and saying, no, this is actually very similar um, to the proposal that was put forward by Israel itself at the end of last month. Um, it it does seem really that the fundamental difficulty for Israel is signing up to any kind of a phase deal of a ceasefire and hostage release that will ultimately lead to a, an end to hostilities, an end to this war, before, in the eyes of the uh, Israeli government, it has achieved its war aim of dismantling Hamas in Gaza. It said that is necessary to have a victory in this war. You land now there. Well, let's get more analysis on what's happening in the region with Hassan Al Hassan, senior fellow of Middle East policy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, who joins us from Bahrain. Welcome to you. Thank you very much for being with us. We don't know the details of this proposed deal. It's not even clear who put the deal forward that Hamas has agreed to, but Israel says it's far from meeting its demands. But it seems like there is more pressure on Israel and Hamas to agree a deal, but also that they're trying to exert more pressure on each other. What's your analysis of what's going on with this deal? That's right. We seem to be in a situation where each party is waiting for the other one to blink. Uh, so essentially, Hamas, uh, on the one hand, by accepting the deal, has placed Israel under a tremendous amount of pressure. 
uh, partly because um, it uh, essentially means that Israel is not uh, looking as uh, not appearing as the constructive uh, player here. I think Israel has had uh, an issue managing its uh, image in those negotiations. About uh, five six days ago, you had Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu come out and say that Israel would march on Rafah, a deal or no deal. And obviously, uh, statements like those are not conducive to an agreement. I think it's important to remember that uh, Hamas now, by accepting this deal, is hoping that uh, we'll see enough internal pressure build up on uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, primarily by uh, families of the hostages and uh, perhaps opposition factions. And we've already heard uh, Yair Lapid, uh, the leader of the Israeli opposition, uh, seem to lend his support for uh, more efforts to really to uh, arrive at a um, hostage deal that would uh, allow for these hostages to be released. So Hamas is counting on a buildup of internal pressure within Israel. It's relying and counting on more pressure from uh, the Americans. And we've already seen reports that the U.S. may be uh, freezing shipments on precision munitions to Israel to dissuade Israel from going into Rafah. Uh, and then keep in mind that we may see a vote at the UN General Assembly on Friday on Palestinian statehood. And let's just say that uh, given uh, the current circumstances, it's not looking very good for Israel if that uh, vote were to go through. At the same time, I think Israel is also hoping that Hamas will blink uh, by uh, applying more pressure on the group in Rafah, by uh, threatening to wage a large-scale attack, by taking operational control of the Rafah crossing, which means, by the way, that um, probably very little of any humanitarian aid at all is coming in, given that the two main crossings into Gaza are now closed. So it's a situation in which uh, each side is simply waiting for the other to blink. There are unconfirmed reports that Hamas might be agreeing to a long-term end to hostilities. Given that Hamas is committed to the destruction of Israel, do you believe that that could be the case, that they would agree to possibly in the future just being a political entity? It's difficult to, I think, project uh, that far into time because we're still in a fast-changing situation. But I think the bottom line, uh, to my mind, is that Hamas uh, would be very unlikely to accept any deal that did not uh, sooner or later involve a permanent ceasefire. Uh, because essentially, by giving up the hostages without securing a commitment uh, towards a permanent ceasefire, Hamas would be giving up uh, its main source of leverage, its main bargaining chips, and then only to see Israel, uh, if only a temporary ceasefire uh, were agreed, uh, come back and then seek seek to destroy it. And by giving up the hostages without um, a permanent ceasefire in return, essentially Hamas would be removing the main source of political pressure internally within Israel, which is the hostage families, uh, on uh, the uh, Israeli government to bring an end to hostility. So I think if Hamas were to agree to a deal that did not sooner or later involve a permanent ceasefire, they would be very simply signing their own death warrants. Hassan Al-Hassan, thank you very much for joining us from Bahrain with your analysis. Well, Louise Waterage is from the aid organisation UNRWA. I asked her what it's like in Rafa right now. Yeah, things are very tense here in Rafa. Um, the last 24 hours have been a complete roller coaster of emotion. Even the last few days, there was so much hope for a ceasefire Anybody you speak to here the last week, the last few months, every day, all they want to know is when there is a ceasefire coming. And it's what everybody has been hoping for. So to wake up yesterday morning to the devastating news that leaflets had been dropped and an evacuation order was in place, it really spread, spread a lot of fear across the community. Um, I'm currently in Western Rafa, but across Eastern Rafa, people started to move. But even outside my window, I was able to see people starting to take down their makeshift shelters, start to pack up and start to leave Rafa. There is a sense of fear and chaos now. Obviously, this is a, a minute by minute, hour by hour situation developing. Um, but clearly, people are hearing the situation at the Rafa border crossing and now deciding to, to leave once again. And, and tell us what the aid situation is like, because more aid had been getting in in the past few weeks, hadn't it? What's the aid situation there now? So there is now no aid entering the Gaza Strip. The Rafa crossing is the biggest and the only entry that UNRWA, the, the largest humanitarian agency here in Gaza, has been using. 
and now there is no aid able to get in. And in addition to that, there is also no fuel. So fuel is really what the agencies need to run this massive humanitarian operation across the Gaza Strip. Fuel is what's needed to, to run the trucks, to get the aid to the people who need it. Fuel is needed in the generators to run the hospitals and, and health clinics that are remaining and not damaged and destroyed. So without this fuel and without these aid supplies, the aid operation here is, is simply going to ground to a halt. What is the aid operation like at the moment? Um, we continue to do everything we can. Our colleagues are providing services. UNRWA runs health centres across the Gaza Strip. Um, even in North Gaza, we have some very heroic colleagues who have maintained running these health services throughout the war. So we do our best to provide these, these services and provide what aid we have. But it's very concerning to know that this border crossing is, is closed and that there is no foreseeable aid entering anytime soon. Around the world and across the UK, this is BBC News. A British woman has pleaded guilty to being part of a global monkey torture network. 37-year-old Holly Legresley was a participant in a private online group that was paying people in Indonesia to kill and torture baby monkeys on video. Let's speak to our correspondent Rebecca Henschke, who's in Worcester, with more on this. Rebecca. So Holly Legresley has pleaded guilty to being part of this global online monkey torture group. She went by the username The Emulator and was in a group on Telegram met from people mainly from the UK and the US. They were brainstorming, crowdfunding and then commissioning people in Indonesia to torture baby monkeys and then film it for them. In court today we heard from the prosecutors who said that Holly Legresley showed a desire to harm vulnerable creatures and also had a hatred for pregnant women and children. She'll be sentenced at a later date. OK, Rebecca, thank you. An Australian woman has formally pleaded not guilty to the murder of three relatives who allegedly died over mushroom poisoning at a family lunch last year. Erin Patterson is facing three murder charges and five counts of attempted murder. Police allege she tried to kill her ex-husband on three other occasions. Ms Patterson has always maintained her innocence. Our correspondent Katie Watson is following the trial. Erin Patterson has always maintained her innocence, but this was the first time that her legal team said she would be pleading not guilty to all charges against her. Now, the charges relate to a lunch that she put on at her home in Leongatha, which is a town a few hours' drive from here in Melbourne. At that lunch, she served a beef wellington with mushrooms, and attending that lunch were her in-laws, as well as her mother-in-law's sister and her husband, too. Now, after that lunch, all of the guests fell ill, and three of them subsequently died. Uh, the fourth guest in Wilkinson, he was in a coma before recovering. But the police said that it was alleged that she fed them a death cap mushrooms. Now, also invited to that lunch was her former husband, uh, Simon Patterson. He did not attend. Now, the charges against her are three counts of murder and five counts of attempted murder. And they also include previous alleged attempts against uh, Simon Patterson's life. Now, also decided at the hearing was that the case will be fast-tracked to the Supreme Court. That means that a trial will come sooner rather than later. And the next hearing is expected in this court here in a few weeks' time. 
Let's just take you live to France now. We're watching pictures there of President Xi's plane arriving in the Pyrenees. This is on the second day of a state visit to France. Emmanuel Macron expected to welcome the Chinese president in the Pyrenees Mountains. Uh, we are waiting to see what will happen uh, during this meeting, but they are expected to have a lunch in the mountains. And this is at the Tabe Lourde Pyrenees Airport. Advisors to the French president have described this as breaking with protocol for a chance for one-on-one -on -one direct chat with President Xi. Apparently no aides will be there, so uh, it will be far more personal. And we'll keep an eye on those pictures and any developments there. Now, personal information about serving members of the UK Armed Forces has been accessed from a system used by the Ministry of Defence. Government officials told the BBC that China was most likely responsible. The Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Lin Jian has dismissed the accusation. Relevant remarks of the UK politicians are absurd. China firmly opposes and fights all forms of cyber attacks. We also firmly reject using the cybersecurity issue politically to smear and vilify other countries. With more on this, our political correspondent Alex Forsyth joins me now from Westminster. Hi, Alex. So what more do we know about this data breach? Well, this data, the data that has been accessed, unauthorised access of this data breach, it is, relates to serving military personnel across the RAF, the Army and the Navy, but also some veterans. And it's access, the, the access to this information was held on a payroll system run by an external contractor. So we're not talking about the Ministry of Defence's main computers. And our understanding is no operational data has been compromised. The information that's been accessed is largely names and bank details of serving military personnel, and as I say, a few veterans. Veterans, and in a very small number of cases, some addresses as well. Now, that external system has now been taken offline. And as you'd expect, the Ministry of Defence is investigating. They're also contacting all of the personnel who've been affected to offer them support and advice on what to do. And it's largely thought that, you know, the biggest risk here is not one of safety and security to the personnel, but potentially one of fraud, if anything. Now, in terms of who might be behind this, we're expecting a a, a statement from the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps, who's going to update MPs in the House of Commons later today. And we don't expect that he's going to name China officially. But as you say, the suspicion in government is that China is behind this. And I suspect that when Grant Shapps appears in the House of Commons this afternoon, you're going to get a lot of questions from MPs about the government's assessment of who might be behind this. But of course, also the much wider security risk that that might pose. Yeah, Alex, we were just looking at pictures of President Xi arriving in France a moment ago. And it, it's a problem that many Western nations face, isn't it? How do they deal with a country that they have huge trade with, um, very important economically, but also that in many ways they see as a threat. Completely. And it's been a very active conversation, not least within the Conservative Party, which I suspect may bubble up again during the course of this afternoon, because there are some Conservative MPs that want the government to take a much firmer line when it comes to its approach to China and to expressly say that they perceive China as a threat. Now, the government hasn't done that. It's talked about much rather its, its wider relationship with China and being alive, of course, to uh, the actions of, of China, but also being mindful of that economic relationship and trading relationship as you say. But I think this incident, although the government isn't going to officially name China as being behind this, because it can take a very long period of time to gather enough information for a government to make such a statement when it comes to the actors behind any suspected attack as this one. So despite the fact they're not going to name China expressly, I think that's very much going to be the centre of conversation among Conservative MPs and within the party, because there is an active discussion about whether the government is taking the right approach to China, with some MPs suggesting they should be much firmer. OK, Alex, for now, thank you. Now let's take you to New York, where the biggest night of the fashion year has come to a close. Guests at the Met Gala put on a show reflective of this year's theme, The Garden of Time. Flowers in every colour and shape have appeared on the green carpet for this year's event. A-list celebrities like Zendaya, Jennifer Lopez, Bad Bunny and Chris Hemsworth have joined Vogue editor Anna Winter as host of the gala. Well, Paige Skinner, associate reporter for the Huffington Post, told us more about who stood out. Yeah, th this was full of A-list celebrities and uh, really great fashion. But 
For me, what who stood out was Tyla. She was wearing a beautiful Balmain gown, completely made out of sand, and it fit her so perfectly. She actually couldn't walk up the steps. She had to be lifted for each step. Um, she was a real standout for me. And of course, Kendall Jenner, who was wearing Givenchy, she always looks great at every red carpet event. Um, it, yeah, it was a spectac spectacular night for fashion. The dress code was Garden of Time. So of course, a lot of celebrities and designers were gonna take that and probably wear some florals. Um, yeah, that that clip from the Devil Wears Prada has definitely been going around tonight on social media. But you know, I, I think it was, it was a cool theme and uh, designers could kind of take a lot of leeway with it. And we saw that with uh, the Balmain dress that Tyler wore. She kind of uh, nodded more to the time aspect of it. Fantastic frocks there. Now, just before we go, let's head back to France and this airport in the Pyrenees where a plane carrying the Chinese President Xi Jinping has just landed and President Macron has arrived to Geep greet his guest of honor for the second day of his state visit. Well, one of Macron's main objectives, we understand, for this visit is to try to convince President Xi to reduce the trade imbalance between the two regions with better access for European firms in China and less subsidies for Chinese exports. They are about to head for an intimate tete-a-tete, -a, -tete, a lunch there, we understand, without uh, lots of their aides in tow. Well, yesterday on day one of the state visit, the uh, Chinese and French released a joint statement saying they'd reached interdepartmental agreements on several areas, including AI, the Middle East and agriculture, and that Airbus is in talks with China over a potentially major aircraft order. Well, this deal... Uh, a visit very important for both countries. It's the Chinese Premier's first visit to Europe in five years. We'll continue to keep an eye on that and bring you the latest. Stay with us here on BBC News. Hello. At long last, a little bit of welcome news in the forecast for the rest of this week after what has been a particularly wet spell for some southern and eastern areas. The Isle of Portland in Dorset have already exceeded our main rainfall in the first seven days. Contrast that with Kinloss and the Murray Coast, where we've not seen a drop of rain recorded yet. We'll switch things.